Welcome to another CO2 Mondays with Trevor. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews, and today I have a special guest, a good friend of mine, Jake Henderson from the Nealands Group. Uh, me and Jake go way back. I've uh, seen him and talked to him for many, many years. This is a technician who has been investing in himself year over year. I've seen him at many trainings that I put on years ago when I worked at Emerson and still consistently learning and trying to be better as a technician in the field. And today we're going to get into some great topics of CO2. Jake has started up multiple CO2 racks from start to finish running these jobs. And I'm excited to have this conversation with him. Jake, welcome to CO2 Mondays with Trevor. How are you doing? Hey, Trevor, I'm good. How are you? And I'm doing so awesome. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Jake, why don't we start off with, and why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? <clears throat> hey, everyone. I'm uh, Jake Henderson. I'm uh, 27 years old. I've been in the industry for about nine. I did an HVAC course in high school in grade 12. Uh, my brother's in the industry as well, which really got me going in this direction. And I started at Neelands about a month after high school, and I've been here ever since. Came up through the apprenticeship program with them. I did all my trade school at the 787 JTAC. Uh, great training there. And just I've been a foreman ever since. I've been running jobs since I was a fifth year. I'm about in my fourth year now running jobs. Awesome. That is amazing. I know you've always been putting hard work in. I know I talk with a bunch of your teammates and they say, man, Jake is such a hard work and, and dedicated. And I love that. So why don't we talk about a little bit about your experience, how you got up to running CO2 jobs as a foreman? So when I was a fourth year apprentice, I got on with a lot of the retrofit jobs. We were starting to get rid of a lot of the R22 some of the larger chains we take care of. So starting to touch the racks as the third year, fourth year, started running these types of retrofit jobs as the fifth year. So really getting familiar with how the racks are running, typical HFC racks, uh, recovering all of the refrigerant, recharging them properly, setting the holdback valves, uh, working on EnviroGuard systems. Uh, I was lucky enough to work under Sean Spencer a lot, actually, when we were doing another yeah. CO2 startup. I took his course at the Union Hall, the CO2 course he used to uh, teach. Uh, so he really got my feet wet with the CO2 a few years back. And uh, ever since then, I've been a part of a few of the other ones. And I, I've ran a few, a few jobs start to finish myself as the, as the lead foreman. Awesome. I, I love that. And so just before we get into the CO2 stuff, I love that you said uh, you did lots of retrofits because this is a huge thing going on in industry right now. Uh, why don't we talk about a few of the... The lessons learned on doing uh, refrigerant retrofits, uh, some of the jobs you've been on. So what I uh, what I really noticed, and I I was I was very fortunate to work under a lot of the uh, a lot of the guys I really look up to, and uh, they they taught me a lot of the tips and tricks over the years of if it's an R twenty two system that's got chlorine in it, so you got to really watch all of your seals and your gaskets they'll swell, and uh, you basically got to be very very proactive when you're doing with these systems. You have to you have to replace all of the liquid valves. You have to replace all of the rubber seals and gaskets ahead of time to avoid any potential leaks. And you have to be very diligent with your leak checking days afterwards. You gotta be proactive with your oil changes. Typically we like to do at least one or two before we start. Uh, I've learned tricks on even that. Like a lot of the time I've seen guys, they do one compressor at a time and then they'll do the separator. But I've learned from other people, shut the rack down, do all the compressors at once, do the separator, and then start the rack back up with the new POE oil, even with the R22 in the system still. And then when you do your conversion, do another oil change and be very diligent with that. I love um, that because that, that is so key because I've seen and I talked to many technicians and contractors who bid jobs without understanding when you do a retrofit like for R22 and you just said it, that chlorine in there man, they have tons of leaks and really cost the job. So that, yeah, that's really yeah. cool. And I really liked where you said that you change all the oil all at once because I've talked to many technicians as well and they did, they did it the other way too. Like you said, just do one at a time, but doing it yeah. all uh, makes a huge difference. Anything else that you've seen on these that really helped you? Uh, you just got to be really careful because uh, I, I find even, even months after once you find you know, you might, you might get everything. You might get all the contaminants and the dirt and debris out of the system by changing your liquid dryers at the racks, cleaning your screens of your TX valves and 
Um, like typically we go around the night of the gas conversion and we'll go and change all the TX valve screens while all the refrigerants out of the system. And then we'll put all brand new screens in. But I find even months after that, you can still get a lot of dirt and debris coming back with all that POE oil washing out the, all the, the piping, that old piping full of carbon buildup. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And that's, that's being consistent, learning over time and then being diligent because the biggest thing on, on retrofits before we get into CO2 is that that planning, that planning yeah. before you do it, like you said, you're going around before you're even doing it and you're changing the oil and you're checking and you're checking where all the valves are and then you're understanding because the biggest thing for a retrofit is that plan. So awesome. Yes, really yes. That. Yeah, the other thing when you're, when you're doing your oil changes, you got to make sure you're obviously, you're cleaning your sump screens, you're, you're checking those pickup tubes, making sure they're in the right way. I can't believe how many times I look at these pickup tubes and they're in the wrong way, upside yeah. down and it's that's another thing you've really got to look for when you, you got you got the compressor out of oil already you might as well go the extra step and clean it with some brake cleaner pick, yeah. put the pickup tube back in properly and and get your poe in there i love it i love it and that that's what it's all about those little little things that and that's the little thing like you said just those little things you already have it out just do that extra thing it's going to make yeah. a world of difference yeah. jake when did was the first time you seen a co2 system or worked on a co2 system that would have been when I was a first year apprentice. We were putting a new store in the, in the Toronto area. And uh, I believe that was the first store in the province that was full CO2 with no, no secondaries, no glycol, anything like that. It was the medium temp and the low temp was wow. glycol or sorry, it was CO2. Um, they use the adiabatic gas coolers on that, that wow. job. Awesome. Yeah, that, awesome. That would have been the very first time I'd seen it. Awesome. And at that point there, you would be an uh, apprentice. You'd be moving cases around, doing piping, insulation. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been there. I've done that. That's where yeah, I, yeah. I've uh, really started to learn is at that point. And so, so you're on this job. That was quite a while ago. So like eight or nine years ago. And now since then, you've been, you're at the point where you're a foreman and you're running CO2 jobs. Let's get into the jobs that you ran from start to finish and what is the process? Like, what is the process for that? I'd love to know. Um, sorry, you broke up there a little bit. You're just asking about. What is the process when you're running a job from start to finish? Are you responsible of getting all the parts together with your team, making sure they're all there? And let's talk about from start to finish what a CO2 installation right. job to start up is all about. Okay, so typically our office will give us a set of plans and drawings with the refrigeration schedule and the blueprint of the of the store. Uh, we'll get our material dropped off in our trailer. We'll go over it with the apprentices on site, making sure that we roughly have the correct threaded rod, unistrut, pipe, and material. And the biggest thing I can't I can't say this enough is you really really got to make sure that you're using the proper copper when you're doing a CO two job. You got to make sure that you got your Type K copper. If you have inch and one eighth and the manufacturer specs the K65 pipe, you got to make sure you have that on hand because that stuff can be difficult to get, especially with everything going on these days. Even uh, the Armaflex, a lot of the a lot of the chains are now specking thicker wall Armaflex. So for the liquid, because the liquid temperature is it's so cold with the CO2. So you got to make sure you're very very proactive with ordering your materials. Yeah, that, and that's very important, like you said, especially now when it's. If you make a mistake and don't order the right amount of components, it could be weeks and weeks, maybe months yeah. to get certain components. And uh, okay, yeah. so so you get all the parts, you get the blueprints, and you head out to the site. I'm assuming so. Hopefully, your parts are there. What what's the next step um, with your team uh, going forward? Well, typically we have to get an overlaid drawing where all the lighting is and HVAC units and whatnot before we start coming up with a plan for our Unistrut hangers for throughout the store. You don't want to. You don't want to get all your stuff up and then you have to move it right so typically we get an overlaid blueprint showing the hvac and the lighting and we'll reroute everything so that we can we can start making our making up our hangers and throwing our pipe up in our instaguard saddles and we'll have a guy coming in behind starting to braise it all awesome and so when you start this do you have multiple teams working say on the low uh temp side and the transcritical side or how does it work? Do you guys do the high, high pressure side first? Is there a process for that when you're doing an install? 
uh, typically it's kind of all at the same time. We have some guys running copper out on the, uh, on the sales floor and we'll have a, a guy or two working on the stainless steel up, uh, up in the mechanical room, going through the roof hatch or the dog house, sorry, heading up to the gas coolers on the roof. Um, that's another thing you really got to watch because some jobs they spec position TIG welding, some jobs they spec the orbital welding. So you got to make sure that you're using the correct tube or pipe whether it be the position TIG welding or the orbital welding. Uh, you got to make sure you're using the proper filler material when you're doing the stainless steel TIG welding. Uh, you have to make sure you're using the proper grinding discs when you're cutting the stainless. You, you don't want to contaminate, believe it or not. There's, there's, there's special uh, grinding discs just for stainless steel. Wow. That, see, I, that's something new to me, right? I, I didn't really uh, know that until you mentioned that to me. So that, that's fantastic yeah. to understand. So where would you find this information out? Would this be in the, on the blueprint or on the legend? Or how would you find out if you know uh, what equipment you need to use, if it's TIG welding or not? So a lot of the time, the manufacturers with the, uh, with the racks, they'll supply a large book. It'll have all of the electrical diagrams. It'll have the piping schematics, which are great for the apprentices to look at. Really gives them an understanding of the piping of the racks and everything. Uh, also in that, it'll give you a spec sheet on what's, what type of material they're asking for. Uh, as well as fittings, what type of fittings they need. And here in Ontario, we deal with TSSA and we have to get the information from them as to what they spec. And we have to kind of work side by side with them, making sure that we're getting the right materials. We have to get a, a pre-inspection done actually showing our material and they, they come before we put anything up in the rafters even. Wow. And, and, yeah, and that, just, you know what, I think that that's good in ways. I've talked to many contractors and they don't like that, but that makes us as technicians be on top of our game to make sure right. that we get that stuff done. Is it a little tedious? Sometimes it is, but there's a lot yeah. of people out there not doing it right. So this is why we need people like that to try to be on top of the people that aren't, aren't doing the, the jobs correctly. So right, you get, yeah, you get in the, and you get the stainless steel done and you're, you're getting the guys or, or the team welding in uh, all the cases on the floor. What is the next step? What, what's your next step as a foreman? Well, we have to make sure that we're, uh, we're ordering our nitrogen when we get closer to uh, the pressure test time. Once all the cases are set, we got everything piped and purged while we're, while we're uh, brazing, especially because I know there's a lot of people out there that don't uh, talk about purging and stuff like that. But with all of these electronic expansion valves and all these high pressure valves that have these small gears and everything inside of them, it's, it's crucial to limit how much carbon we're putting in these putting in these pipes and even with the with the stainless steel you got to really make sure when you're using your grinding when you're using your grinder you're getting all that debris out of the piping and we have to use a facer tool which basically cleans the edge of the tubing so we can prep it for the orbital welding a lot of the time you'll get that those shavings and all that stuff inside the tubing you got to really be proactive to make sure that that comes out and uh yeah once everything's piped and everything's tight we basically are, are getting ready to do our pressure test. So we have to notify TSSA. This is when we are going to do our inspection. And I mean, leading up to that, if you have any leaks, you obviously have to find them. And then we'll bump the pressure up to TSSA spec. Somebody will come out and we'll conduct a, an on-site pressure test. Typically, they want to see it last at that value for about two hours. Normally, we get it up to that pressure for a couple of days just to be on the just to be on the safe side, because we don't want any leaks. It's not just about getting signed off. It's about, you don't want to have service calls. You don't want to have it. You, you don't want to have leaks, right? It's, yeah. it's, you're only hurting yourself. Yeah, no, exactly. You get the job done right the first time. You don't have to worry about leaks. Uh, question right. though, when you were talking about the grinding, do you actually have nitrogen blowing through it while you're cutting it? Or do you just blow the pipe out afterwards? Typically with the stainless, that's actually a really good idea. You know, I haven't actually seen that happen. We're normally just purging while we braze. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to cutting the stainless, we typically just clean it out after. Okay. Just because yeah. a lot of the time you're doing it in a tri-stand or, or if, yeah. you're, if, you're, if you're prepping some tubing or some piping, then you're kind of doing it at, yeah, at a different location. But yeah, you, you, could, you could definitely purge it with nitrogen while you cut. Yeah, I, I just thought I'd... Ask that. So, so you get this up, you get the pressure test up and you do it to TSSA standard. Most of the manufacturers I've seen, uh, well, on the, on the transcritical side, I've talked to some manufacturers today, they put it up to eight or 900 pounds is, do you do it higher than that? Do you do it go all the way up to 
1,600 pounds or do you do it to 2,000 pounds? What, what is the standard? That, that's a really, really good question, actually. So over the years, I've seen a couple of manufacturers do it a couple of different ways because we have to isolate the low side from the high side. Mm -hmm. But that gets difficult because they ask us to have everything, everything connected. Yeah. So I've seen it where they actually put these blank off plates under the discharge service valves of the compressors. Mm -hmm. And then you rely on ball valves or other means of isolation on the, on the, uh, on the uh, gas cooler outlet. So you really got to be careful because you don't have any pressure relief valves while you're pressurizing your pressure test. Otherwise they'll pop, right? Because you have to go 10% over that value. Nice. So typically the transcritical booster racks that I've seen for the high side, they blow at 19, sorry, 1740. Mm -hmm. And we, we pressurize 110% of that. So wow. I think that bumps it up to just over 1900 PSI. Yeah. And uh, on the low side, it's 650 PSI. And I, and 100, 110% of that as well. Yeah. So you really got to watch, you really got to watch when you're, when you're at, when you're doing your high side and your low side at the same time, you're kind of relying on some valves not leaking by or bleeding by into the low side. So I typically always have a gauge on the, on the outlet of those valves, making sure that you don't have anything bleeding by just as a safety precaution, because it's, it's, you are dealing with some very high pressure during those moments. That's such a great idea of uh, checking it on the outside because that, as because uh, I've talked to many manufacturers and they've seen it many times where, you know, a valve wasn't closed properly and then their component gets damaged. And then all of a sudden a technician or the company starts to run the system. And then all of a sudden that you get a broken component because you went over its pressure rating. Um, right. For example, you know, you go over six, 650 at 110%. I know the, the one on the Copeland ZO scrolls, I think that those ones go at like 550. You know, so if you had that one in the loop, you'd be um, blowing that pressure relief. So it's important to, just like you said, Jake, that's, that is awesome. So now you do your pressure test, you, you, everything's looking good. It's holding for a couple of days. And what's your yep. next step? So the next step is you want to you wanna bleed off all of that nitrogen. And uh, you're going to get ready for your vacuum pump. So, of course, you're going to get your nice vacuum pump. You're going to get your, uh, your true blue hoses so you can get down a very good micron level. A lot of guys will use uh, soft copper with flare nuts. That works great too. Yeah. And uh, you're going to, of course, you're going to change your vacuum pump oil. Number one thing, you got to change your vacuum pump oil. And what I see a lot of people do is they rush, they jump the gun, they get it on a vacuum pump. And, you know, a couple of days go by, you still can't get a vacuum. Well, your system was tight. You know that a lot of the time it's in your hoses or your copper tubing that has the leak. So you got to make sure while you connect all your flare nuts or your hoses to the system, you leave them closed off at the service valves. Service valves are the best spots to go on or the compressor service valves. Uh, liquid dryer core is always a good spot to go. Uh, try to always go on a service valve. That's the, that's, that's the best thing that's worked for me. And you gotta watch though. You gotta check your vacuum pump with a micron gauge with that, that attachment, everything going up to the system, making sure you're pulling that down. Cause if you can't pull that down, you're definitely not going to be pulling your whole system down. So once you've proved that your hoses and your tubing and your vacuum pump are all working good, you got your fresh oil in the pump, you're good to go. You're good to start opening up everything. Use your gas ballast. A lot of people crank those gas ballasts down with the channel locks. It's there for a reason. You should be using it. So try to use your gas ballast until you get three or four thousand microns and then close it off. That'll help save and preserve your oil. Awesome. Yeah. And so what do you try to get your uh, evacuation down to? Because I've seen some CO2 manufacturers say 250. That's what they're looking for, 250 microns. So what do you guys, what do you yeah. try to do? Yeah, the last job I did, we had four racks. Uh, I had a couple that were about 350, 360 microns. And I got so, one down to 180. Wow. And the other one was about 220. Wow. So I'm really, I'm really, really liking these true blue hoses. I find they're incredible. Yeah. Very fast. And they do a really, really good job. Yeah. Last, uh, earlier this year, I was in a, a training with Jim Bergman and he explained how to do a yeah. proper evacuation. And every time I do a training with him, I learn something from him. And uh, it's, uh, it's just such a, a great thing to understand because I never knew how to po pull a proper vacuum until I've uh, listened to him and watched some of his uh, videos and doing some of the Yeah, he's, 
he, he's great because he actually has that video on YouTube where he's he shows you when you connect that hose up to that eight CFM pump. And now all of a sudden you're getting less than one CFM. But when you hook up these vacuum rated hoses, especially the true blue hoses, yeah. you're getting eight CFM out of that hose. Yeah. And that's what's so amazing that's, about it. And just there, there's just processes and you just learn them and you do them the right way. It speeds up your time. You, you think yeah. you the, probably quicker to exactly. go buy those hoses and come back to the job and hook it, them up than, than just yeah. waiting there six hours. So awesome. Exactly. So, exactly. so you get it down, you pull a deep vacuum, kind of like it, you said, and then what's your next step? Well, when you're ready to break your vacuum with, uh, with CO2, yeah, unless you got to do the triple sweep or, or whatever, uh, some people do that, some people don't. Uh, the last job I didn't, I didn't need to, I got down low enough. Uh, you got to make sure you, you put vapor in. Some manufacturers spec that you, you have to put 350 PSI of CO2 vapor in. I mean, I don't normally go that high. As long as you get about 100 PSI in everywhere, I feel like you're pretty safe. So normally I get about 100 PSI, 150 PSI in everywhere, and I'll go on the microthermal computer. I'll check all my transducers, make sure that that vapor got everywhere in the system. Make sure you don't have any spots that maybe, maybe it didn't get there. Maybe it's not sitting here yet. Or, you know, you got to make sure you have your vapor everywhere and then you can start charging liquid when you're ready to start up your equipment. Yeah. yeah and that's a, I talked to many manufacturers too. They all say a little bit differently, but you know, hundred PSI or 150 or 10 bar, eight, 10 bar, anything over that yeah. triple point, you got to get over that triple point. And when you're over that, then yes. you, you're not going to cause dry ice. I was talking with um, a few sessions ago with uh, Lars Jensen from Advancer, and he says one thing that he's seen missed is where there was uh, water in a system and you pull such a deep back and it's so far away that you could cause it to turn into ice and not even notice. And on your gauge, you look like you got a deep vacuum, but you really caused ice. You pulled it down um, right. to that point. So just be aware of that, that you make sure and do what you just did because you, you go around and you check the whole system to make sure that you have a deep back in the whole system. And then when you pressurize, you make sure you got a 150 PSI or 10 bar in all the locations. Because all of a sudden, if you still yes. have one that's either in a vacuum or it's at zero, there's some cause for concern, right? So Right, that's a good, that's a good point. I, I, I forgot to mention that is when, when you are checking your microns, it's important to go to that furthest location, go up to the roof, check out the gas cooler service valve, go out to the furthest case on the sales floor, the furthest coil in that cooler out. I know it might be a pain to get out there, but it'll be worth it in the long run if you do that. Yeah, no, exactly. I love it. So now, now we got some vapor in there um, and we got it throughout the whole system. So we're pretty happy with that. What is your next step and your team's next step? So I, uh, once we're evacuated, typically we go around and we make sure that our gas cooler fans are turning the right way if we have three phase motors. We check all of our, our high coolers, our cases, make sure we got fans on everywhere, make sure all of our transducers are reading and our case controllers are online, make sure, make sure we have enough CO2 on site because sometimes it's tough to get the liquid CO2 on site. Make sure we have all the proper hoses and connectors to, to get onto the cylinders for the CO2 because they are different than a lot of the other cylinders. They're, so, uh, you know, sometimes that stuff is difficult to get your hands on. You got to make sure that you have that ready for your startup day. And that always comes back to that planning and preparing. And it doesn't really matter if it's CO2 or another refrigerant, but it's so important when you invest the time to plan and prepare properly, it's going to make your job easier. Not saying that you might not be able to get certain parts anyway, but as long as it's on your list and you know, you're preparing for it, you have a better chance of getting, especially when you order it before the job even begins, you got a better chance yeah. of getting it when you do need it. Right. And hopefully it's there. Do you guys, when you order up your CO2, do you get it just in the 100 pound, 150 pound cylinders or do you buy a big tank of it, like a truck full of it? How do you guys do that? Is it so normally we get the cylinders. Okay. As much of a pain they are when we have four rocks to start, we got a hundred cylinders, we're rolling around. We've done, the, uh, we've done the big tank before. We haven't had the best experience with it because we have to use a liquid CO2 pump with that tank. Hmm. And we've had a lot of problems with those pumps leaking. So we just decided to go back with getting the cylinders on each job and it, it, it works, it works pretty well for us, the, the individual cylinders. Yeah. We, we, we make up these manifold headers so we can get five or six cylinders onto a header and we can feed and close off 
each one at a time. So you always have one or two going in at the same time, just to try to speed up the, just to speed up the process. Yeah. Okay. So this is, this is a good point. So you build a header probably out near the loading dock or outside where there's a cage and you have all the cylinders. Where does that yeah. go? Where are you plugging in that one? So you got five cylinders to it. Where are you going to connect that? Is it a three, eight line? Maybe your copper line you're using or. Yeah, a lot of the time the manufacturer will provide us with a quarter inch st uh, stainless steel braided hose. Okay. And we charge it right into the liquid dryer core. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's a great. So now we're charging, we're starting to charge. So we got, we got it, we got our, we got to evacuate it. Now we're charging. What's your next step? Just keep getting liquid CO2 in your, in, in your rack and watch and make sure your fans are still running. A lot of the time these jobs are, Sometimes even on temporary power, if it, you know, if, if they're rush, 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 you gotta, you gotta watch, make sure that nothing funny is happening out on the floor. You gotta get your premises running around, check in the fans, make sure they're turning the right way and uh, just continue your startup. A lot of the time the manufacturer will come out with a representative to help along with the startup. Um, sometimes they don't, we'll have one of our micro thermo technicians on site helping us with the control side of things. Yeah. And just kind of working alongside with, with the foreman and the, and the crew on site. Okay. This is a, this is a good point. So as that refrigerant starts to get into the system, the pressure starts to build. I'm sure there's a sequence of operation that needs to happen. Uh, what is, what is the, the sequence? So the medium temperature compressor should start first. Um, what, what is the sequence after that refrigerant starts to make its way in there? Well, if it's a transcritical booster system, then yeah, you got to watch, make sure that all of your compressors are turning on when they need to, because your low temp will be discharging into your medium. So you got to make sure that you're not overpressurizing your suction of your medium temp. You got to make sure that, uh, that that's all, that's all happening. And I mean, I, it's hard to explain, I guess, but. <laughs> yeah. So, so your medium temp starts, you continue to add yeah. gas, temperatures start to come down a bit and then. As it starts to sage on, I'm assuming the low temp side, more compressors will start coming on. Because I know there is, when I've um, looked at a few of the manufacturers, there there are steps um, for their startup sequences. They have certain they have certain a sequence. So you have 50% of the medium temp running or the transcritical side running, and then all of a sudden the 25% of the low temp side, and then all of a sudden more medium temp or transcriticals will turn on. And then there's just a stage on sequence that's all done by controls by the yes. controller. Um, and do you guys on your, on your staff, do you guys have a, you have the control team that comes in from Neelands that helps out with that and sets that up or yes. is that from the manufacturer? So there's, I've seen it both ways. Sometimes we have a representative from our team that'll kind of be in charge of that. And, there's one manufacturer we use a lot and they, they always send out a technician and they kind of monitor all that while we do the charging and opening certain valves and getting certain systems running. We don't normally start every system at the same time. We'll start with certain things yeah. before others during the startup just to kind of get the system running. And then at w once we start getting enough refrigerant in the system, then we'll start opening up the cases. We normally try to pull down the boxes at, uh, first. Okay. Yeah. Well, see, a lot of times these are new boxes. They probably got new concrete. It's going to take a lot longer yeah. to pull, pull those ones down. Um, many years doing supermarkets. I understand, I understand it takes a lot longer to pull the heat out of those, yeah. that concrete. So now you got the system up and running. So it's, it's working and it's going, what are the next checks that you need to do? Um, and to verify before, you know, you start getting product into the, to the cases. So really good point there. Um, when you're starting up your, your freezers for the first time on a new build and you do have that new concrete, I normally, if I have the time, I'll run them as a cooler just above freezing. So about 34 degrees, 33 degrees for about a week or so if I have the time. Mm. Now, what I recently ran into, and I never noticed this before, was a lot of the time these coils have pan loops in the drains, right? So on the low temp racks, you got to watch because when you're running those as a cooler, that liquid is a lot colder than that. So it'll start to condense. And because it's not in a space that's freezing temperature, it'll actually drip. And now you'll, you'll have water droplets on your floor and all over your box. I just had this happen to me. 
it, because of that low temp liquid on those low temp racks, I was running it as a cooler for so long. I, I was really, I was starting to notice and I was picking my hair out trying to think what the heck's going on here. But that's what it was. As soon as I started dropping that, that temperature down just below freezing, I was noticing those pan loop tubes were starting to solidify and they weren't, they weren't creating those water droplets all over the floor anymore. We were thinking, the pans were leaking or we have loose connections on our plumbing and it's all insulated already because it's a freezer with heat trace and everything. But yeah, it was, it was that low temp liquid. So on the next startup I do, I'm going to, I'm going to see how difficult it would be to raise up that low, that low temp liquid temperature through the use of the heat exchangers on those racks and, and see if we could raise that up above freezing. That was one thing I learned on that last job. That, that's a, a great point because you know, you got, you got that new concrete there and that that's a, uh, awesome lesson learned for sure. And I, I'd love to hear yeah. after you do your next one to see how, how that worked, because I, I know you can do that. And I know you will be able to do that and figure that out because that's, that's yeah. something you will not understand until you see it really. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a weird one. I've never, I've never had that before. I've also never really noticed that before. So that, that was, that was neat to see. That was neat to see. Yeah. And it's good that you explained that you take about a week to cool down these, these floors, because I've seen it where, uh, rushing a job, trying to pull the temperature down really quick, and then all of a sudden you get a crack or you get damaged floors or damage something inside there. So it's important to do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Another quick little thing: you got to make sure that you have your vents installed in your in your freezer boxes, because I've seen it where there wasn't, and it, it heaved. The box heaved on the one corner because mm. it didn't have the the barometric relief in the in the in the freezer wall. Yeah, because there's so much going on on a big job like this and you have multiple teams. It's good to, as you as the foreman, to understand to be talking to your team, motivate them, con giving them some confidence, say, did you check this? Did you check that? And having lists, I, I know for sure you must have certain lists and of areas. Okay, here's the, the box area. Did we, get, we, did we tackle all this stuff? And, and then taking a systematic, a systematic approach to complete all this stuff. So that's super cool. So you get the boxes down. You're about to get... Um, the product into the into the system maybe about to turn it over to the store owners what are the things that you're looking for and checking just to verify that everything's going smoothly the well, product temperature you got to make sure that once they do start if they start putting some product in their meat cases or their deli cases that those cases are working right i mean i know we know what the the discharge air temperature is but we got to make sure that those fan speeds and seeing a lot of these cases now that have variable speed fans that you can change it with a little controller on the back side of them. You got to make sure that your air curtain is good. If you have to smoke the cases to see what that air is doing, you got to oh, make sure that that product temperature is not rising too much during its defrost cycle, especially the fresh meat I'm finding. You really, really got to watch that. So a lot of the time these chains, they'll, they'll, they'll put a little bit of product in each case. They won't completely fill them up, but mm -hmm. they'll put a little bit of product in just so we can kind of monitor product temperature. Once we think we're pretty satisfied with the discharge air temperatures and how the defrost is working, are these, are these defrost, are they, um, are they terminating the defrost? You know, are they, are they working right? And it, it, once we're, once we're pretty content with that, then we'll start to be a little bit more finicky with, with everything else. Yeah. So I like one thing you said there, smoke the cases. Why don't you explain uh, what you're doing that for and how you do it? Because I know there's lots of people that, have not done that before. So I've seen the, uh, you can buy smoke bombs. I haven't done that in, uh, in cases. A lot of the time we'll just, we'll just get a piece of cardboard where we'll yep. light the end of it with a lighter and we'll just kind of get it to the point where it's just a little bit smoky yep. and we'll go along the discharge air of the case and we'll just watch that airflow and see where that air is going. Is it getting sucked back into that return air? Is it, maybe it's a little bit stronger over here, over there. It's also a really good way of showing the store. Like this is why you can't go above those load limit lines. You have to keep your product below those load limit lines. You're blocking the airflow. It throws off the air and it, 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 it gets thrown out. You also got to watch when um, you have HVAC systems that are close by to your open deck cases. You got to watch, make sure they're not infiltrating and overpowering the air curtain in those cases. Maybe you need to raise up those speeds of those fans. I love that because that's so important. I've seen lots of jobs. I've even been on jobs where I didn't do that because uh, I didn't know when my first start right. of my career. But that's something that is so important because when that airflow gets broken, uh, you're you're losing a lot of efficiency. 
product yes. temperature, many different things. There was something else that you mentioned there was the defrost, checking the defrost. What is your process? Do you build the defrost schedule? Is it the manufacturer that builds the defrost schedule? Is it your team at uh, Neelands that builds the defrost schedule? How is your approach for defrost? So the, the defrost is set up between the manufacturer of the cases, the coils, and the racks. So technician from the rack manufacturer, in my experience, they will basically build a defrost schedule and a defrost end page, they call it, on the microthermal system. Basically, it's one central location where you can see all of the defrost, what their termination set points are, and you can click on any button and graph how it's performing. And they get a lot of this data from previous jobs, but also from the case manufacturers and the coil manufacturers of what they spec for this size coil in this temperature box. Or, or case, right? Or what product they're gonna be putting in here. And, and they figure out what their defrost termination should be, whether it's off time defrost, hot gas defrost, electric. And, uh, and we just kind of fine tune as we need to. Yeah, so what is some of the things that you've noticed? What are you looking for when you're going through those defrosts and you're clicking on them and you're looking for the termination? What are you looking for um, to catch your eye and be like, I gotta go check this case. There's something specific? Uh, maybe if the case has taken a little by a while to pull down after its defrost cycle, maybe that's a little bit of an eye opener of maybe something's going on that shouldn't be, or, um, maybe it's not quite getting to the same temperature that the other cases beside it are when it's in defrost. Maybe the other ones are getting up to 65, 70 degree return air or, or sorry, discharge air from that, that air in the store that's being blown around. Now, if you're, if it's an off time case and you have basically the store's ambient air being circulated over your coil to defrost it. And maybe one of them is only sitting at 32, 35 degree air. I mean, maybe you're going to go and have a look at that case and see, is it iced up or what's going on? Where's my sensor located? What's, you know, maybe something's going, maybe something, maybe there's a manufacturing issue with where those sensors were located. Maybe there's a sensor that's crossed. Right. Yeah. Awesome. And so the defrost as well, I should ask you this, is, are you using mostly hot gas defrost? Are you using reverse gas defrost? Are you using electric defrost? Because there's different strategies. So on the CO2 jobs I've seen, it's typically ejector defrost or hot gas defrost using the low temp discharge because that's, that's, at, a lower, that's at a lower pressure. You're able to use that with your copper. Uh, there are some other jobs out there that we've done. I haven't had a lot of a lot to do with them, so I can't really speak to that. But they they're using stainless on all of their on all of their coils and cases out. Well, not cases; they're more so these warehouses. So they're using stainless for all of the coils, and they're able to use the transcritical gas wow. for the for the defrost. So that that would be kind of neat to see. Yeah. But uh, no, tip from what I've seen, we're normally using the hot gas defrost from the low temp discharge. Yeah, awesome. And how, how has that been for you? Do you feel like it does a good job on defrosting, completing the defrost, making sure there's no frost left on that coil? Yeah, I think if everything's set up okay, I think, I think it does a pretty good job. I, I think it, from my experience, I, I think over the years we've gotten better with it. That's for sure. We've been able to kind of see where we could improve and, and capitalize on that on the next startup. Yeah, no, I love that. So now, so now you, you did your checks, your, your store's up and running, the customers are starting to load up the cases, job, jobs turned over back to the customer. What are some of the things that you learned or lessons learned over the, the jobs that you did from start to finish that when you get onto your next one, things that you're going to just make sure you pay attention to or things that you may, may point out to your team to have a closer look? Uh, I would say just being proactive. Like on my, on my first job I did, I noticed we had a lot of water leaks coming from our coils. And it's because they, they use these coils that have a, a decorative drain pan with a sleeve that goes directly up to the actual drain pan of the coil. But a lot of those, those plumbing connections were a little bit loose before our plumber had come in and connected. So just being proactive on things like that, going around while the coils are still in their crates when you're de-skidding them, you know, go around and crank those on so that when the plumber goes in and they put their fitting on, they don't loosen that off. Um, dumping water in the cases as soon as the plumber's done. Before that plumber leaves the job, make sure that they don't have any leaks. Make sure that, you know, your guys are saddling their, their piping properly. 
making sure that their, their hangers are going on tight and their beam clamps are on tight and everything's getting glued so you don't have any water droplets on the floors that the service guys need to now go in and fix uh, on overnights because they have to get a scissor lift. So making sure that you're, you're really, really going through your armor flex glue, you got to really make sure that, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're sealing that up nice and, uh, and you're using the proper insulation. Like I, like I said earlier, you got to be really proactive with your ordering of materials, making sure this is something I didn't really mention before, but making sure that you have all the materials you need for your, your pressure relief valves. Because normally these, these valves, they go to a central location on a CO2 job. You can't put piping on the outlet of a pressure relief valve because of the dry ice concern. So you need to make sure that it's at the exit. So that's why we have to mount the actual valves outside. So normally we run all of the relief piping out to the roof. We'll make a big unistrut hanger so everything's really, really nice and tight and secured and cushion clamped. And, and uh, there's a lot of parts involved and a lot of special adapters. And anytime you get these special fittings or adapters, you got to make sure that they're rated for the CO2 pressures. And a lot of the times, from my experience, they, they're tough to get sometimes. So you got to make sure that you're ordering the correct parts and, and you're, being, you're being diligent and, and, and thinking about those possible lead times being, being a little bit longer than normal, especially nowadays. So go over that stuff ahead of time, weeks before you're going to need it if possible. And th that's probably the best advice that I can give for somebody running a job is just really be diligent on, on your material ordering, what you're going to need. If you have to pre-build all of your relief valves ahead of time to make sure that it's going to work, do it. It only takes 20 minutes to, to dry fit everything and make sure that you have proper thread sealer. I really like Nylog. Nylog and Teflon, I think, are the, it's, it's, the best, it's the best thing to use. I don't really like using leak lock or anything that's, you got to think these, these pressure relief valves need to be replaced every five years. And I know you're probably not going to be the one doing it, but you don't want to be that service guy up there, you know, with, 24 inch pipe wrenches trying to get these things apart so yeah i try no, to I, think of the service guys as much as i can that's good and that's that's comes with experience because i was on i was construction for many years and i've done a, i did a lot of the wrong things because i didn't know and nobody really taught me and then i got into service and i'm like oh man i can't believe i did some of these things and then when <laughs> i went back into construction i made sure that I wasn't yeah. putting those ball valves up where you needed to get a scissor lift right. or a four feet, 14 foot ladder to get to the ball valve to shut off a case or something because it, right. it just didn't make sense. So I really like having the, you know, both sides of the atmos, uh, uh, atmosphere of it, you know, like doing a little bit of service because I'm sure you do on call and stuff and doing uh, construction and you have a more of a well-rounded um, mindset, I believe, uh, seeing the, those both sides. How was it when you were uh, starting it up and, uh, you know, working with that transcritical valve, like that high pressure valve and the bypass valve, was there anything there that you uh, kept an eye on or things that you were just uh, making sure that were wor it was working okay? Uh, so one thing with the high pressure valves is uh, during the startup process, you got to be diligent in cleaning it. They do have, um, the CCMT valve is the most recent one that I worked with. It's um, the Dan Foss valve. You got to watch, they have a screen around the main gear of that valve. And that needs to be cleaned after typically one week of runtime. So between that and your oil separator filters, liquid dryer uh, core replacement, of course, um, that high pressure valve, you got to make sure that you clean that screen, you clean the insides that you replace the O-rings and you build it back together. Um, that's really the only thing that I had to do with that valve on the last few startups that I've done. Awesome. Yeah. And how, how, how many hours was that again? You did that clean out or how long? Uh, normally about one week of runtime. Okay. Awesome. One week of runtime. And sometimes it'll surprise you what you find in there. I mean, sometimes it, 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 it surprises you how much uh, stuff gets away from you, you know, as diligent as you are. I mean, who knows how it got in there. Right. But yeah. it, you, that's why you have to clean it as, as, as good as you think you did of a job you still have to you still have yeah. to be very diligent and clean everything and change your liquid dryers and yeah. when, and when, did, when the does the, the liquid dryers have to be changed does the manufacturer spec that for you in their manual that was about what the last manufacturer i worked with that was one week as well okay so of course at, at um at startup 
obviously you put all the new filters and dryers and after you do your evacuation, we normally balance the system to about 40 or 50 PSI just to get it above positive, right? And then you, you put all your filters and dryers in, then you can start your, your startup process. And then your oil separator filters, the last manufacturer wanted it done 24 hour, 48 hour, and then a week, and then about three months, I believe. And they're, they're, the last one was very, very clean, actually. The, and the same with the liquid dryers. But the liquid dryers, you have to be careful when you replace those on CO2. Brett Wetzel and Kevin Compass actually talk about that. And they're, uh, I, think, I think Kevin has a really, really good way of doing it, where he, he puts the discharge gas in that, in that shell to raise it above the dew point so you, so you don't have any fear of creating dry ice. Because I've actually heard horror stories of when people turn that back on, it has actually exploded the dryer core. Wow. which would be a whole mess for weeks, I would imagine, right? Yeah. So you got to be really careful when you do that and evacuate it and, and get that up with vapor. Fill that area up with vapor before you open those liquid valves. And like you said on one of your last podcasts, you really got to make sure you open those valves really slowly. Yeah, and that's, that's important. And that's little tips, even going from, you know, standard refrigerants to, CO2, you should be doing it with standard refrigerants, but nobody ever taught me to open valves slowly. I was just whipping them open. With CO2, you definitely, definitely need to yes. uh, do things at a slower pace, but it, it's all yeah. the same. It's just refrigeration. Love it. Right. Right. We do have a question here. I'll, we might as well just ask it now. Um, any insulation experience with polyiso insulation instead of Armaflex? I'm not sure what poly, no. polyiso is myself personally, so... Not personally, no. We we only ever really use Armaflex. Yeah, same here. That's what I've always used. And and you did talk about it. What are they now? Like some um, customers specking for like the low temp. Is it is it three quarters? Is it one inch? I'm sure it's different on every job. What's the ones that? So believe it or not, actually, they're now some chains are different, of course, but they're now actually putting inch and a half Armaflex on the suctions which I think is incredible. I know it's a lot of extra work and a lot of extra gluing, but if you think about the efficiency of the system, I mean, that's incredible. And it's a huge step forward in my opinion. And for the liquid lines, I mean, the liquid lines on CO2 are so cold, you got to watch. So we, we normally put one inch on the liquid lines, especially on the low temp liquid. I've seen three quarter on the medium temp liquid, but one inch on that low temp liquid is normal from what I've seen the last couple of years. Awesome. And that's good to know because I've, uh, I've seen it many times where, um, you know, that either the insulation glue is not done properly or the, even that insulation yeah. is really cold. Like it's really yes. cold because you don't have yeah. enough insulation. I can't imagine the cost of that one and a half inch and a half suction Armaflex, but yeah. it's definitely worth it. I bet in the long run. Yeah. Some chains are even putting that on their HFC stores as well. Oh, wow. The inch and a half. Yeah. See, so we're getting two and one eighth suction lines with inch and a half insulation. It's, so we're using like 625 saddles, 625 Armaflex saddles, ins, wow. ins, uh, Instacart saddles. Sorry. Wow. That's super impressive. <laughs> yeah. Um, a, uh, any other advice you would give to someone who's going to start running a job soon or maybe looking to become a foreman at their company? Uh, so, some advice for technicians out there? To be honest with you, just like I, when I was coming through the apprenticeship program, I was always online researching every night, HVAC talk, looking up old, old, uh, old, old uh, discussions on anything, anything rack related. I find it's really hard as a younger apprentice to take part of the conversations that some of the guys at work are having and because you're not quite at the level of, I don't know, maybe it's just certain people are harder to talk to, I guess you could say, when it comes to the technicalities of these racks and what you're doing. But if you can learn one thing a day, I mean, it's one thing a week even, just ask questions, try to pick the, the guy's brains as much as you can. And as a foreman, I think it's really important to try to teach your guys the tips and tricks. Try not to hold things in. I know they might be your tricks, but you know, if somebody else is using your tips and tricks, just take it as a compliment, right? So I, I think that's really important that some people try to hold it in, but I think it's really important to pass that on to the younger guys, the other people you're working with so that, I mean, if you can help develop other guys in your crew, it's only going to help you in the long run. Yeah. I think that's really important as a foreman. 
I love that, Jake. I love that. That is so important. You know, uh, sharing that knowledge is what I'm all about. Refrigeration mentors is all about. And I love that you yeah. said that because it is so important because we need more technicians out there. We need more people to have more knowledge out there and the more right. knowledge you share. And if they, those people can share that knowledge, it's going to help you in the long run, especially when it's on call at two o'clock in the morning and you don't have to take that call or go to that job site because you shared that tip with them and they can fix right. the problem themselves. Right. I love it. I love it. Well, Jake, thank you so much. I'm going to see if anybody has any more questions. If anyone does have any questions, since we're live here, um, just shoot it in the chat. You can unmute yourself if you have a question for myself or Jake. And um, I just really want to thank you, Jake, for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. I've learned a lot. I've got a bunch of notes here. And, awesome. Uh, thank I you love, for having uh, me. I love the conversation. But yeah, if anybody does have any questions, you always can reach out to me, uh, shoot me an email, shoot me a message on LinkedIn. Really appreciate your time, Jake. Once again, I uh, hope to see you next week at uh, CO2 Mondays with Trevor. Have a great one. Thank you, Trevor. Take care. Thank you. Hey, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you got something out of it, something that you can use in your daily life. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button, and click the bell button because when you do click the bell button, it will notify you anytime new videos are released. Also, check out the Refrigeration Mentor webpage at refrigerationmentor.com where I'll have all the different trainings, upcoming events, the different podcasts I've been on, as well as the Refrigeration Mentor podcast. If you want to check that out on Apple, Spotify, Google, any service provider of your choice. Super excited to see you at the next video. Now let's get a conversation going.